Good morning, church. Everyone wants to come in and sit down. We'll get started this morning. Good 
morning. I'm Everest. My mom and I wanted to take a few minutes to share some highlights from our tr trip to Turkey. As you can see from the map, we traveled around the western part of the country, starting in Istanbul, which is so huge that half the city is in Asia, and you can cross a bridge to the other half, which is in Europe. We saw lots on our travels, ancient ruins and rich history and world heritage sites. Turkey, or Asia Minor as it's called in the Bible, is home to the seven churches of Revelation. It's where the believers were first called Christians, and it was the center for the growing Christian movement in the first century. Today, it's 98% Muslim with government-run mosques everywhere. To be Turkish is to be Muslim. But in each place we went, we had a chance to meet with local believers, churches, and missionaries, and hear testimonies of how God is at work to restore and reclaim this country. Some highlights for me. Going to see castles and ruins, the Pamakule, which are some really cool and old natural hot springs. The food, my favorite was pide, baklava, and Turkish delight, and the people we met, especially Dave and Ron, who were the missionaries that were with us the whole time. A highlight for me was touring ancient Ephesus on the Sunday and having our church service be Everest reading the Bible in the same amphitheater that Paul preached at. That felt surreal, but also really profound to realize that the mission that Paul was on to share the good news is still the mission we're called to today. God's story stretches from creation to new creation, and we're still in the same portion as Paul, between the resurrection and the return. Standing on those ancient ruins, I felt so connected to the living word of God, and it really hit my heart that the Bible isn't a finished story from the past that I apply to my life. I'm meant to apply my life to the ongoing story of the Bible. Um, I would highly recommend traveling with a child if you want to experience the joy of seeing somewhere new in just a whole different way, take a kid with you. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest highlights for both of us was Everest's decision to get baptized, so I'll let him share a bit about that. We went to the Basilica of St. John, which is where the Apostle John is buried, and there was a baptistry there which made me think about getting baptized, but the water was so smarty. I talked to Dave about baptism and why I wanted to get baptized. I'm thankful I've known about Jesus my whole life, but I wanted to choose to follow him for the rest of my life. A few days later, we were in Antalya and went to the Mediterranean Sea. That's where I got baptized. We'll leave you with a little video of it, and if you want to hear more stories from our trip, then come to Wealth and Laura's on Thursday at 7. I'll make sure to bring snacks. <laughs> Baptize you now in the name of Jesus, but in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we baptize you. <laughs> well, that's really exciting. Congratulations, Everest. It's great to be have you in our family. Great to have, have your report this morning. I have a couple of things I'm going to talk about. First of all, um, an update on Wayne Muirhead. Mark says that he's still in the hospital. He's going to begin physiotherapy. His mind is a little clearer, and so we're, we're happy for that and continue to pray for him as he recovers and progresses. Uh, Bernard, Bernard Krogsgaard, Alicia sent a note, which is on my phone, so I'll talk about that. Just give me one second. So Alicia says, please let our church family know about Bernard. Thank you for your thoughts, well wishes, and prayers. Bernard's battle with COVID was a scary experience as his immunity system had been depleted two days prior with a cancer treatment. He was quite sick at the ER, but he was given excellent care. The emergency COVID antibiotics had him on his feet by the end of the regimen. It will be a while before Bernard regains his strength. Thank you again for placing his name at the feet of the one who heals. So remember to keep Bernard in your prayers as well. Okay, a little bit about the shepherds and the core team. 
As of the morning of May 28th, we had a new Shepherd team pulled together. Thank you for your support and your participation in making those appointments happen. We had our first meeting that same day on May 28th, and we spent some time getting to know each other and discovering what our dreams are for the shepherding team and for the church. On June 4th, we had another meeting. The shepherds team met with the core team to discuss how the, new, the two newly formed teams will work together. So the core team consists of these people on your right, Scott, Aaron, Jen, and Dave, and each of them are responsible to maintain contact with a number of different ministries and to provide support to them. This team was pulled together because of a recommendation that the transition team made to the shepherds. At the meeting between the core team and the shepherding team, we discussed how we can work together as a combined leadership team. We desire to work closely together with each core team member having a shepherd to provide support and input. So with this leadership team model, we have the core team and the ministry leaders as the hands-on people, enabling ministries that work together to accomplish our mission of seeking Christ and sharing Christ. They will be able, they desperately need, to draw in the rest of the members of our congregation. That's you. We want to encourage full participation. We want you to be owners, not renters. The shepherds will provide oversight and will be able to concentrate on pastoral care for the congregation. All of these roles are extremely important as we journey together as a church. There will be meetings ahead that are shepherd and staff meetings and, and other meetings that involve shepherds, staff, and the core team. The more voices at the table, the better, and we look forward to working closely with the staff and the core team as we continue to develop this leadership team model. For the summer months, the shepherds are hoping to spend time visiting members of our church family. That's you. So if you would like to have coffee or a chat with one or two or more shepherds, just contact us. Our calendars will be filling up quickly this summer. Thank you. the Lord. May I please uh, welcome you and uh, I ask you to you. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, O oh God, for being with us. Lord, we thank you that we already feel your presence in this morning, O oh God. Lord, let this morning be not about us, but only about you, O oh God. And as we worship you, seek our heart, seek our minds and thought, Lord God. We praise you, we honor you, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Bye. 
my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous! share some of the thoughts I was thinking of as I prepared to uh, speak at communion here this week. And I, I want to talk about grounding. Um, not grounding as in the punishment, but uh, grounding as in being in touch with who we are and who we're meant to be. Um, I'm not sure I have the best analogy, but as I'll speak about, I think that's probably okay. So spring, springtime is probably the same in your host, but it's definitely a busy season in our family. Uh, both Jasper and Asher are smack in the middle of their ball seasons. I've been head coach for a group of five and seven year olds, which is always interesting to say the least. Uh, but it's definitely fun to uh, try and teach them some basic skills and watch their improvement through the season. I'm also helping with Jasper's team of nine and 10 year olds. And with that team, the skills are a little more developed and the role of co coach is a little more involved and a little more complex. Jasper has taken on pitching for the first time. Um, so that's a brand new set of skills for him to learn. I've told him a few times that my pitching career consisted of three pitches. 
two balls that were nowhere near the strike zone, and the, on the third ball, I got the guy to pop up and end the inning, and I never pitched again. <laughs> so I don't actually feel like I'm the best pitching coach for Jasper, uh, but my dad has pitched a fair bit, and so he's been helping Jasper out with some of the mechanics. Uh, the first time I saw Jasper pitch in the game, he did really quite well, but of course, as is going to happen with any pitcher, let alone a nine-year-old boy, um, he, he found some struggles finding the plate at one point. I called time, I ran out to the mound, and I gave him a bit of a pep talk, but I later asked my dad, what, what do I say to a pitcher in that situation? My dad very matter-of-factly said, well, the first thing you say is, are you having fun? I'm not sure that's how everyone would approach that situation. Some people might go out there and try to uh, start talking about the mechanics, leading with your foot, finding the right arm angle, following through to the plate. Some might just go full cheerleader mode and say, you know, you're doing great, just keep it up. But are you having fun? <laughs> that sounded like a good grounding comment to me. Baseball's a game. It's not life or death, it's meant to be fun, right? If Jasper's response to are you having fun is no, then all of a sudden we've got a much bigger problem than just balls and strikes. So asking the question, I hope, reminds him to have fun, relaxes him a bit, and puts him in the best position to pitch to the best of his abilities. Now here's how I connect that to what I want to talk about today. When I come to the communion table, sometimes it feels like a grounding exercise to me. It's a reminder of who we are. We don't need to worry about the mechanics of Christianity. We don't need to think about how we're praying or how we're living or finding the right words or following through. We don't need to pretend that everything is okay if the whole world feels like it's really not. When we come to the table, maybe we can just imagine God saying in that pep talk, are you my child? Ephesians 1, 3 to 7. Before the creation of the world, he chose us through Christ to be holy and perfect in his presence. Because of his love, he had already decided to adopt us through Jesus Christ. He freely chose to do this so that the kindness he had given us in his dear son would be promised and given glory. Through the blood of his son, we are set free from sins. God forgives our failures because of his overflowing kindness. So if you believe you are God's son, no matter what else you believe, what else you think, how you pray, if you believe you are God's son, you're welcome at the table this morning. If you have elements on either side, feel free to come and take and eat.
invite you again to stand up as we sing <coughs> when the roll is called up here. <coughs> Part, as soon as they see this slide. While they're doing that, I would like to welcome Stan up here if he was paying attention. <laughs> we're, we're blessed again to have Stan with us to speak to us again this morning, but we've been blessed many times by Stan over the last couple years. Um, in, in the fall of 2021, 
the shepherds who were shepherds then began discussing what was going to be the next thing for Glen Elm after COVID was done. Um, we decided it would be good to get a team of people to discuss and discern God's vision and plans for Glen Elm in the coming years. And so a transition team was formed <coughs> and a facility for that team would be needed. Um, so we approached Stan, had conversation with him, and he agreed to do that for us, which was a blessing. In the February of 2022, um, doesn't seem like it was that recent, but <laughs> it was. I went back and looked at my notes. So um, the transition team and Stan began the journey of what next? Stan made many trips to help guide and discuss or guide discussion at the meetings and to present things to the team that would get them thinking at things that, about things that were familiar, but also stretching them to look past the familiar. So leading a group of 25 to 30 people, in case you don't know, is not an easy job at the best of times, but it makes it even more stretching when it's a group of people who of our diverse ages and um, history backgrounds with Glen Elm. To try and keep them focused ahead of the task that was ahead of us was trying to pop popcorn in a pot without a lid. <laughs> Kernels flying everywhere. This is how our meetings were. It's like here and here and here. <laughs> Um, Stan's job in that case was to try and contain all these popping corn kernels and visions and dreams and bring them all back in and focus us. That was, that was what we had asked him to do. And, and that was a challenge. Some, some, some meetings it was a challenge for Stan to do that, but he did a great job. And it was an interesting, very interesting God-guided um, adventure that the team and Stan have had been on. So I want to present you with a box of popcorn. <laughs> so every time, every time you pop a bag of popcorn in your microwave, I wouldn't suggest opening it. But as you're listening to it pop, just think back of the transition team and all the fun and all the times that we had at the transition team, and just be thankful that someone else is now trying to contain your popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> but as, as one who was on the transition team and also one of the shepherds at the time, I just wanted to take the time we did and want to say, well, first I want to say thank you to the transition team. I don't know how many are here who were on the transition team, but stand up. It's just, it's interesting to see who, I know this isn't all of them, but this is a good representation of them. There's many that are missing. I would like to say thank you again for the time that you spent in meetings with the transition team and in prayer for our church. Um, it was a very, very important role and I thank you for that. And I also want to thank Stan for your willingness to take along, take on this task of leading a group of people who were part of a church that had no staff and were trying to figure out what next after COVID. Um, tough time. We realized that the task given you was difficult as far as the time frame goes because you already had a full-time job. You live eight hours away. Um, so it was a huge commitment for you to come back and work with the team and, and also do many presentations for us at church here. Um, so, so doing all that work, transition team, and still trying to juggle family time um, had to have been very difficult. And, and I, we, as a team and a church appreciate it very much. And we thank Pat also for being a support for him, but also letting him go so many times here. Um, I know that your family was having struggles during that time too, and um, you know, having, having Stan here was important for us, but also important that he spent time with his family. So we just wanna thank you for your wisdom and encouragement in the process and for your patience with us. God has guided us through this, and we thank you for helping in this process. And we ask that you continue to keep Glen Elm in your prayers as we try to flesh out what God has next in his plan for us. Thank you, Stan. And now you 
you can preach. Thank you guys so much. It's good to be with you today. Am I missing something on the mic yet? All right, very good. Oh, yes, very good. <laughs> Popcorn. I'm going to use that analogy from now on. That is a good analogy. But it's been a joy to be with you and to serve you over the last year or so. And... Um, Appreciate your prayers for us as we've, uh, uh, as you know, Pat's mom passed away May 1st after she had been there five months of caring for her. And so uh, Pat's had to re-immigrate to the country. I was excited when we got to the border and they didn't blink an eye, they just let her back in. So, <laughs> so I was wondering, you know, how long can you stay away and still get back in? So it is, it is my delight to be with you today. And I just thought it was ironic that we're gonna share food together and I've been given the assignment of talking on fasting. <laughs> that should be an easy task. Let's pray together. Father, I'm so grateful to you for this church, for their faithfulness, for their tenacity. Father, for their love for one another. Father, I'd ask that as you open up this next chapter for this congregation that they will depend on you and because of that your revelation will be clear to them about what to do next. Father, I thank you for all the ministry that uh, has happened and continues to happen out of this group of your people. Father, help us to be faithful today in our listening. May we hear what you have for us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You've been in a series on spiritual disciplines, which I think is a really good series that churches ought to do fairly frequently to kind of remind them of some of the basic practices of the faith that have nurtured people throughout the centuries, has nurtured the church throughout the centuries. And so I find the, the subject of fasting quite interesting because if you go into Foster's book on the, spirit, uh, on the spiritual disciplines, you'll find some really good, simple advice about how to do fasting, how to be involved in it, how to take care of yourself physically. You know, some of us have medical uh, issues with diabetes and other things that mean we have to fast a little different than others. You know, you have to be mindful of all those things. And so I was, I was as I was pondering, what could I possibly say that, that might be additive to this conversation as opposed to the kind of things you normally hear, um, I passed on a couple of texts uh, that I said, you know, here's kind of where I'm thinking about being. I've changed my mind. I think the text that will help us the most today on this topic is actually the temptation of Jesus. And you'll find that, at least the version I'm going to be using in Mark, in Matthew chapter 4. And so in Matthew chapter 4, it is in context of Jesus fasting that he has to negotiate the highest priorities of the kingdom. Did you hear me say that? It's in the context of fasting that Jesus negotiates. And I do believe there's a negotiation there because if Jesus is not tempted, then it's just, it's just a play. Jesus is actually determining the direction of his future in the context of fasting. I love how Matthew overstates it. He, was, he fasted for 40 days and he was hungry. I'm going like two hours and I'm hungry. It doesn't take much. And so I, I want to take us to, today I want us to explore the kind of negotiations, internal decisions that we need to make as believers in Jesus that occurs in the context of fasting. 
And I'm not saying or suggesting that fasting is the only context they can occur in, but they're, such of, a, they're, they're of such a large caliber, they're of such a large level that I would highly suggest fasting. This is a good time for fasting, you know. If you're looking for, um, you know, when do we fast? Well, we, we fast naturally, folks, when we're in grief. There are actually times in which we do not have to be told we need to fast because we do. And so I would suggest fasting in the Bible, you find it in a couple of places. One is when you're utterly defeated and you can't figure out in the world why you're losing. But another time that fasting is involved in the Bible is when difficult decisions are to be made. By the way, I was quite surprised. I knew this, but I was quite surprised as I was looking throughout the Bible for text on fasting. There's really not a lot of material there. And I think one of the reasons is that the earliest believers uh, assumed fasting was part of the spiritual equipment that one had. It's much like the Bible doesn't teach you how to pray. It tells you in what context you ought not to pray so people can see you, right? But it does not actually kind of say, here's how you do it. Even when Jesus is asked, how do we pray or teach us to pray, they're given a sample model that largely focuses on the need to forgive one another. And so even Jesus doesn't go into this is, this is how you do it. And I think a lot of that is built around, there's kind of this basic <laughs> assumption that we as human creatures will talk to God sometime, someplace. And so I'd like to explore this text with you today and see if there's some things that might help us understand what kind of place does fasting bring us and where does God want to take us? Let me read the text for you. Then Jesus was led up, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said, if you are the Son of God, Command these stones to become loaves of bread. He answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on a pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and... On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, said to him, again it, is, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all of these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, away with you, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Henry Nouwen wrote a book, which I would recommend to any of you if you've not had a chance to read it, In the Name of Jesus, Reflections on Christian Leadership. And it's about 57 pages long, so if you uh, like little books that you can read in a few hours or less, this book is it. And what Henry Nouwen does in this particular book is he reflects on the temptations that we find ourselves as leaders, and I would say in general, just as Christians, the temptations that uh, we find ourselves facing as believers, um, and he places it in the context of Christian leadership, but I think whether you find yourself as a leader or not really will be immaterial when you, when you hear the nature of the temptation, each of these temptations. Let me just point out a couple of things that are kind of, you know, just the text itself. Did you notice, and I, I stressed it a little bit, Jesus was led. He was not the leader, he was led into the wilderness. The Spirit took him there. And did you notice that, and again I stress this too, is Jesus kept, he kept playing to Jesus' identity. If you are, if you are the Son of God, did you notice that in some ways what Satan was offering was a quick fix? You know, if you are the Son of God, you don't have to do this suffering thing. We can, we can make this thing quick. We can give you all the kingdoms of the world if you want that, if that's what you're after. 
And so there's a short of a kind of a shortcut kind of built into each of these temptations. Um, we notice in this text that Satan can quote scripture as well as anybody. And did you notice that Jesus quotes text himself? And that when Jesus responds, it comes from, you might not have noticed this unless you've got your footnotes there in front of you, he responds with citations from Deuteronomy, roughly around Deuteronomy 6 or so. And it's about that place where the discussion going on in Deuteronomy is what will the people of God do when tempted? And so the story is framed as if Jesus is again in the wilderness like the children of Israel, and he's being tempted in some of the same ways in which they were tempted, but Jesus, of course, is in Matthew 4, successful. Let's take a look at the first temptation. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And now in, in his book takes this one to be the temptation to be relevant. There's a couple of ways. I mean, when you're hungry, bread's pretty relevant. You can't think of anything more relevant than food when you're really hungry or when you're really tired, sleep. So some things are really relevant. But I think here when we think of relevant is that this thing is about meeting my needs and that's what it's about. And Jesus is being presented with that same scenario. If you are the son of God, there's no reason for you to be hungry. You, you don't have to be hungry. You can just simply make stones into bread. It is in the context of this one that Jesus says, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. How is that the antidote to being relevant? I think it works something like this. I want to remind you that it's in the context of fasting that Jesus is negotiating this, and so this may help you on your own spiritual journey. I, I want to be relevant, and I think there's a level, you've got to play this on both sides. There's a, uh, there's a point at which we want to be relevant, but there is a way in which culture is sucking us in, in which we can be so terribly relevant that we have nothing to say. And so there is the temptation. I think in terms of kind of leadership, if you want to go that anger, the, the, the temptation is to be efficient. I want to be ready with the answers. And sometimes we frame our ministry, I can't lead because I don't have the answers. Let me tell you this, you don't. That's not the basis. That's not the basis on which you lead. The more that I've been involved in Christian leadership, the more ignorant I realize I really am and how naive I, I am. And maybe even how hopeful I am sometimes against the odds. In what ways are we tempted to meet our needs now? Can you see how fasting might be a bit of a way to challenge that notion? Isn't fasting the intentional withdrawal from things that I think I generally need? And we can find here that the temptation to be relevant, the temptation to meet my need now, might not be the deepest level at which God wants to work with us. And that's the point I think that makes the most sense here, is that fasting can provide us with the place where we can meet the things that normally dominate us more than we would like them to. And by the way, some, more than one person has pointed out that fasting needs to involve far more than just food. There's lots of things in our culture that we indulge in that are basically neutral for the mo most part, but they don't become neutral after a bit when we've overindulged and we've realized that somehow social media, binge watching, it can be lots of things that dominate our life. And it's not that any of them are bad in and of themselves, it's just that they've become so important that they've become almost non-negotiable in our life. You want to see how important your phone is to you? Deliberately set it down for a whole day and watch how you struggle with it. <coughs> That's not going to be everybody I know, but it'll be lots of us because now we're trained to have that thing right here. And so 
It's in the context of living without <coughs> that we actually can have a glimpse at what's really important. I think we're moving into a time, particularly economically, where lots of people are having to learn how to live without or with not so much. This can be a frustrating time, but it also can be a spiritually productive time. Let me move to the next temptation. The next temptation, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, God's going to catch you. Let me summarize the text. To which Jesus replies, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now he calls this one the temptation to be spectacular or sensational. I don't know about you, but at one point in my life I wanted to be famous. I'm not even sure that's even worth the effort. Now, but it is for all of us that we want our church to be significant, we want our group to be significant. This, this temptation is one that's very real because it tends to suggest that God works most in the spectacular and not the mundane, not in the ordinary activities of life. You ever tempted by this one to be spectacular, to be the significant person, to be the savior? It comes easier than you think for many of us. But here the temptation is that Jesus would do something, the angels would catch him, and everybody would know. I've, I've often prayed, I don't know about you, as I've struggled with my own standing, uh, understanding of how God intersects with the world, I've often prayed for that miracle that was undeniable. I haven't actually gotten that ever. Maybe God knows what I really need. But have you? If only this, then it would be true. So, this temptation, this one that makes us think that God works in the grand, tempts us to think that God doesn't work in the small. And here's for me the, the application of this text. When Jesus replies from Deuteronomy that it is written that one should not put the Lord your God to a test, let me flip it around a little bit. In a way, it's saying, we are not God, we are humans, we are creatures. Can you make peace to live in the limits that God has set? This comes hard because I was incredibly idealistic as a younger person, and I thought, I think we probably ought to, there's a balance here, tell kids they can be anything they want to be. The truth is there's some things you can't be just by virtue of the fact that to get there you have to be something else, right? That, that again, I, I like the impulse of where that's going, but I just turned 60 this last year and I'm looking at my list of things that I was gonna accomplish in life and I'm starting to cross things off, saying, okay, that doesn't fit, that's not part of the story, that's not how this is gonna work out. Is it possible that part of fasting is learning that we live with limits and that that's okay? We can only be in one place at a time. I think this had to be an amazing experience for God who came to us in Jesus who could be everywhere, but now had to be in one place. It's learning to live within God's limits for us. This is not that we can't aspire and we can't grow and we can't dream. But it's during fasting that we negotiate, I think. Not the only place, prayer is also there. It is fasting that we can negotiate. I am not God. And I'm going to make peace with that. Closely related to this is the realization that 
I could be wrong. I wish more of us would entertain that for the sake of our own humility, is that here's my best thinking on this, but I want to tell you, because I'm limited, because I'm human, I could be wrong. And it's okay to live there. It's actually the only place you really get to live. If you live in the place where you think you can make the decisions that God makes, you will hurt somebody, including yourself. Jesus is having to negotiate what it means to be human in obedience to the Father. Satan's temptation is saying, you know, we could give you all the glory now. You could bypass all this suffering. But Jesus seems to have found a different recipe, one that I don't particularly like, but seems to make a whole lot more sense out of the decisions I have to make from time to time. Have you figured this out? Suffering, then glory. You figured this out? Suffering, then glory. That's a part of the story. It's not that it's all suffering and it's all doom and gloom, so I don't want to sound that. But I think sometimes we want the sensational without the suffering, and that is not. If there was anything I could do to help balance some health and wealth gospel kind of folks, I would say, well, tell me what you think of suffering. Because the Bible talks a lot about it. Paul can't even begin to talk about ministry without saying suffering. That that is part and possible. That, in fact, it's not a bad thing to suffer. It is a human thing to suffer. If I had time, I'd go into how God suffers with us. But I think one of the ways he did, he did it was through Jesus, in Jesus. Okay, let's do the last one. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and said, I'll give this all to you if you'll just worship me. If you'll just bow down, you can have all this. Wasn't Jesus' mission to be the kingdom of God would be everything? Would consume everything? <laughs> Sounds like exactly kind of where Jesus' mission will end up. It's at this point Jesus says, Away from me, Satan, or away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and suddenly the angels came and waited on him. The angels came and waited on God. I want you to hear that. The angels came and waited on God. The whole notion is absurd if you think about it. Now he calls this one the temptation to be powerful. This probably is the one that has the most grip in our life. We are told that we can be powerful in multiple ways over and over again, whether it's the new car we drive, whether it's the technology we have, whether it's the job we're able to get. But I think one of the temptations that we have as people is our desire. And by the way, again, I think all of these things can be flipped in the positive. We, we can talk about what good relevancy looks like, what it looks like to be sensational in a positive way. Jesus' miracles did create a, you know. So I want you to hear this as, as something that needs a bit of a balancing here. But this one, the temptation to be powerful. This is the hardest one for us to get because every culture that ever existed existed on the basis of being powerful. And even we get sucked into the temptation that we want the church to be strong, which is a positive thing, but it can also be a negative thing because historically when the church is strong, it's ugly. It doesn't do good ministry. You know, so, so I want us to handle this one very carefully, but it is in the midst of fasting that we can begin to realize. When I fast, I realize that I can't make it three hours without wanting to put something in my mouth. It's a reminder that I'm not as powerful as I think I am. I'm not as strong as I think I am. I remember the first time that I was involved in fasting because it wasn't typically anything we talked about at church. It was not a part of my church world. So I'm glad that many of you are growing up with the acceptance that fasting is one of the activities that we participate in. In fact, when Jesus is, uh, talks about his disciples, it's when you fast. It's not if you fast, it's when you fast. Jesus expects us to be part of our equipment for spiritual formation. 
there's no better place to struggle with. We used to call it in Oklahoma, too big for my britches. You guys remember that saying? Does that saying make it this one? Too big for your britches? The Bible is full of reminders that we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, and that we ought to actually, in fact, prefer one another over ourselves. There's some real challenging notions there. But if I think I'm the most powerful, then I'm expecting you to do what I want. It, it's funny, I found in leadership, you know, I've got a leadership team involved with my college, and sometimes, sometimes that popcorn just goes everywhere. <laughs> and there's times I want to declare, let's stop this nonsense, I'm the president. <laughs> that only seems to make the popcorn pop faster. <laughs> it doesn't have the results that I want it to have. And so I'm reminded that if you have to remind somebody that you're the leader in the room, you're probably not anymore. <laughs> but it does get to the notion of fasting reminds me that I'm weak. And that's okay. It is absolutely okay to accept the fact that we're all weak. We humans do this really funny thing week in and week out is we say with our mouth that we know we're not perfect and then somehow we expect it of others in the next second. In the midst of fasting, we got the opportunity to negotiate some things with God. And by negotiate, I mean really just finding our place in where God wants us. And so we can have the temptation to be powerful or sensational are super relevant. Let me commend you for something. And there's lots to commend you for. You know the slow work that you've done over the years with young people in this congregation? It's not spectacular. News articles aren't writing about your children's ministry over and over again. In the world scheme, it's probably not even powerful. And while the kids themselves may experience this sensational, those of us as adults putting it together, we know that it was probably the best we could do today. But you know something? For most of the young people, some of which were you at some point, it's been enough. And I think that's an example of just one ministry that is done at a slow drip that wouldn't impress people outside of us. I think fasting brings us to the place to distinguish what is, we might say, urgent from what's really important. Fasting once is probably not going to do a lot of good, but let me encourage it. Making fasting as a regular place where you're willing to meet God, where you're willing to meet God, that's what makes fasting work, if it works. If you're willing to meet God, in that place, fasting, prayer, we can put the other disciplines together with it, then God can do this amazing work in us that's not built around power or sensation or relevancy. Our job, very simply put, is to point other people to Jesus. 
That's what this community of believers is to do. Now, what form that takes, that takes a little work on our part. That takes a little decision-making. That takes some working together. But the mission is pretty simple. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to serve your people today in this way. And Father, I come recognizing that there is far more that you need to do in my life. And Father, we collectively confess that we need to find ourselves in places of fasting so that we can create space for you to do the work you want to do in us. Father, help us to be faithful in all that we do, but mostly, Father, help us to see what you're up to and teach us to imitate. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, Jesus said that there were times of fasting and there was times of rejoicing. And so I believe I'm to, tra tra to transition from fasting <laughs> to rejoicing. Folks, it's been a joy to serve you over the years. I don't plan to not be part of your story wherever I can weave in. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, we love you. We appreciate the ministry that you do. We appreciate uh, the things we've done together. And uh, we're really excited about this next phase of your history as you figure out how to work with a larger leadership team. I, I love the teamwork. Uh, I love the same, what I heard this morning about the more voices, the better. That's good. That's us taking care of each other as God's people. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Or am I the final word today? Well, if you got something, well, you've got the final word then. Thank you, Stan. Thanks for, for being here with us once again and for your, your words, your teaching, and your wisdom. We are going to have potluck. I hope you can all stay. It's good to fellowship and, and feast together. Um, maybe fasting too, but today it's feasting. <laughs> uh, so uh, as, we as we get up and leave, we need some help setting up uh, tables and chairs. Probably take down about half the chairs or two thirds of the chairs and then there'll be room for, for tables and we'll get that done briefly. Let me lead a prayer, giving thanks for the food, and uh, once again for Stan. Father, we are, we are so blessed to be your children, to have fellowship with one another in Christ, and to recognize you as, as God, as provider, as sustainer. We give you thanks for all the ways that you do that with the with the food that we have to eat today, we give you thanks. And for, for Stan and for his, his ability to teach and guide and help us over these last years, we give you thanks. Bless us through this day, through this afternoon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>